Well, that Recording is, in progress. It's 1.32, and I will call this meeting of the Sacramento Transportation Authority to order and ask the clerk to please uh, call the roll to establish a quorum. Yes, sir, and we have two members who will not be present, Eric Guerra and Rosario Rodriguez, for the record. <laughs> so, members Frost. Here. Hume. Here. Jana Karpinski-Costa. Present. Kennedy. Here. Maple. Here. Sandhu. Avdis. Singh Allen. Here. Spees. Present. Telemontes. Here. Pul Terry. Here. Valenzuela. Here. Vang. Here. And Serna. Here. Uh, I would like to clear on the record I'm here. I think my Paul Sandu. Yes, Mr. I... Sandu. Thank you. And we do have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, and I would ask uh, Director Telemontes, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're packed in at a lively and crowded dais, so hopefully we won't have to stand up again. <laughs> okay. And Mr. Chair, I have some statements that yes, we need please, to make. Yes, please, please. Okay. Uh, this meeting of the Sacramento Transportation Authority is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel on the Comcast Consolidated communica Communications, and AT&T U-verse Cable Systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at metro14live.satcounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated Sunday, May 14th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. The Board of Directors fosters public engagement during the meeting and encourages public participation, civility, and use of courteous language. The Board does not condone the use of profanity, vulgar language, gestures, or other inappropriate behavior, including personal attacks or threats directed towards any meeting participant. Each speaker will be given two minutes to make a public comment and are limited to making one comment per agenda or off agenda item. Please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted or disconnected while making your comment. To make a comment in person, please fill out a speaker request form and hand it to clerk staff. The chairperson will open public comments for each agenda or off agenda item and direct the clerk to call the name of each speaker. When the clerk calls your name, please come to the podium and make your comment. To make a public comment by phone, dial 916-875. 2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Clerk staff will transfer each caller into the meeting. You may send written comments by email to boardclerk at setcounty.gov and your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. For accommodations, if you do need an accom accommodation pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act or for medical or other reasons, please see clerk staff for assistance or contact the clerk's office at 916-874-5451 or by email at boardclerk at setcounty.gov. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding of the meeting procedures. Okay, thank you, and uh, I want to welcome everybody here in, in chambers um, this afternoon. Uh, our first item is for off-agenda public comments, a chance for members of the public to comment on an item that is not on the agenda. Um, Madam Clerk, are we, do you have a list of the names? We have not received any speaker slips, but we, we can catch it okay. afterwards, yeah. Hi, thank you, members of the board, um, Chuck Burks and uh, staff, uh, Chuck Burks in City of Isleton. Uh, also, the Crawdad, I just want to get this in, the Crawdad Festival is back. It's 17, 18 June. And also, I want to get this, uh, just note that on your board, it, um, it has reps from every city except, except Isleton. Uh, but the reason I'm here is, and, and, and Mr. Boosie and I have talked several times over the uh, past couple, three years about getting, getting uh, uh, road maintenance dollars for Isleton. <clears throat> there's, there's none in this budget other than routine maintenance. Um, the, uh, even though, you know, when you, when you go by formula, we have no population, we have no miles. However, being located uh, on the Route 160 and between 12 and 160, and the traffic going between the Bay Area and Sacramento, we have anywhere from 30 to 40,000 cars a day impacting our streets, also cutting through our town, going to 12 and uh, going north and south. Um, you know, Mr. Boozy will tell, tell you we've had exchanges. I'm always um, late to the game. I'm probably uh, you know, a week or two late after the, the deadline or a paper or two shy. 
Uh, the notices come by email, but mind you, with a, a small city, with a small staff, I get anywhere from you know, 60, 70 emails a day. I, it'll take me two or three days just to go through one day's email. I don't go through emails. I, you know, I, I would need notice. So admittedly, whether I'm late or not, I still have 30, 40,000 cars a day going through town and my roads are in bad shape. Um, I don't have the staff, like I said to myself, and, uh, a few folks. I don't have assistant engineers, deputy directors, analysts, uh, technicians, grant writers. Um, so um, what I'm asking that, um, is that the uh, the board consider uh, uh, making an allocation for a rural community on a, on an annual basis, so I can catch up with my roads and deal with all the traffic that goes through through Ileton and through the Delta. Um, the uh, uh, I know that um, I, I may not be timely on on some of my items, but if I got you know notice, um, like I said, you know staff is short, but when I when if, uh, as archaic as it may be, if you send me paper, we'll respond, we'll get it done. Um, okay, thank you. I'd ask you to maybe wrap up if you can. But that, that, you? That's, that's all I have. Just okay, bring thank attention. you. And I, I, uh, Director Hume has a comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I know we don't want to get into a discussion on an off-agenda item, and thank you, Chuck, for being here. and appreciate that you bring that to our attention. Uh, Ileton does get a carve-off, as does Galt. Is that correct from uh, general funds? Yeah, that's correct, and we'll be presenting that amount under item eight. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, public comment for off agenda matters? And there are no further public comments. And nothing on the phone. Okay, then we'll move on to our uh, consent items. I believe that's three through five. Actually, Chair, we do have the executive director's report for item number two. Oh, I'm sorry, two. I skipped over you, Kevin. I apologize. Okay. Executive director's report. Wonderful. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm going to do a summary of the Executive Director's Report, uh, which is in the uh, board package, but uh, most of this is about funding. Um, so the SACOG 2022-2023 Regional Funding Round staff recommendations were released. Um, on April 28th, SACOG released their staff recommendations for this round uh, with approval anticipated May 18th at the SACOG board meeting. These recommendations include the award of $101.5 million to projects within Sacramento, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba counties. And approximately 67.1 million is being recommended for projects within Sacramento County. Um, now we're going to dig into a little more detail on um, on our Measure A Smart Growth Incentive Program. Um, so we, so in November, the STA Governing Board approved a strategy for leveraging Measure A Smart Growth Incentive Program funding as the minimum local match for the SACOG Community Design Program. Uh, which is part of the regional funding round I just talked about. Uh, this strategy has resulted in 11 million in awards. In fact, all the competitive awards went to projects within Sacramento County, including the cities uh, within. And the strategy leverages Measure A dollars at a eight, about 7.7 to one or eight to one ratio. Um, this funding will be allocated to the cities of Citrus Heights, Elk Grove, Folsom, Galt, Sacramento, and the county, and a full list of the $11 million awards is in the executive director's report. So I think that's a great success for SDA and the uh, partnering agencies. Uh, so SACOG 2024-25 regional funding round working groups. Uh, so in March, SACOG began moving forward with the 18 month process to revise the upcoming regional funding round for fall of 24 or spring of 25. SDA staff has been included in these staff level working groups and will provide updates as we move through that process. Um, and then we're gonna talk about regional prioritization for competitive grants at federal and statewide level. So the number of competitive federal and statewide grant programs for transportation funding has steadily increased uh, with SB1 in 2017 and the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act in 2021. Just in California alone, there are nearly 500 cities and 58 counties competing for these funds, making it very difficult for a single entity to punch through this sea of applications to get competitive grant awards. Several regions have created a strategy around prioritizing, prioritizing projects uh, for specific grant programs. One region that has had success in doing this is the Metropolitan Transportation Committee Commission. Sorry, the MTC is a multi-county MPO representing the nine counties in the San Francisco Bay Area. Through this strategy, they have been able to capture nearly two-thirds of the federal awards coming to California in the last few years through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. SDA staff, along with staff from SACOG and other agencies, have begun discussing how this might be done in a mutually beneficial way, recognizing our shared priorities. 
This would be a, a big lift, but could be instrumental in leveraging Measure A dollars in the future, and I will continue to provide updates as these discussions progress. And the final update I want to provide is on the SASA legislation, uh, Assembly Bill 333, so, or 333. So on November 10th, uh, the SDA and SASA Governing Board approved the reestablishment of the Sacramento Abandoned Vehicle Service Authority Program by pursuing state legislation. Um, Assembly Bill 333 was introduced by State Assembly District 10 Stephanie Wynn in, in January 3rd, 2023, and AB 333 was then referred to the Assembly Transportation Committee for a hearing. However, staff from the Assembly Transportation Committee asked that AB 333 obtain the support from the California Association of Counties, CSAC, Legal counsel for a scheduled hearing in April, and county counsel and CSAC legal staff could not come to agreement in time to meet that scheduling deadline on April 14th to make the Assembly Transportation Committee uh, year one hearing in this two-year session. We now have still have time until January 2024 to come to agreement on the language or take an alternate approach. So I want to just provide an update on that legislation. With that, that ends my executive director's report. Open any questions or comments. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Kevin. Director Maple. Uh, thank you, Chair. I uh, just had a quick question uh, about what, what the disagreement on language is between, is it between CSAC and STA, or is it between the author and, just trying to figure it, thank you. I think it's between uh, legal counsel, CSAC legal counsel at uh, STA, just trying to get agreement on language that would work for both agencies, and then potentially we would need to obviously get the author to amend the bill to the language that everyone would like. And just one more quick question. So since the timeline is now being pushed out into the, the next year, does that impact STA at all in a negative way? Well, I would say that negatively, currently we're not receiving any funds, so that would continue to, uh, we would continue to res not receive fund for probably longer than we anticipated. Uh, so that there would be a negative impact in that regard if we cannot get this up and running. We are looking at alternative approaches, um, but that's, currently, that's kind of the current status of where we're at. Great, thank you so much. And, and thank you, Director Maple, for asking questions about that. I mean, that's that's a, a, a big deal. It's going to have a big impact on all of our respective jurisdictions. And, uh, you know, you and I have had a lot of discussions about this, and I, I hope we can work through that and only be facing this funding shortfall for a relatively short period of time. Because um, I know we, I've heard personally from our own code enforcement and certainly the Sheriff's Department about the impact this is having on their ability to um, uh, remove some of these abandoned vehicles, um, which, which cause a lot of problems, I think, in our communities. So we'll be looking for an update on that as soon as you can provide one, um, Kevin, so thank you. Okay, I don't see any other uh, comments from uh, directors. Any public comment on the executive director's report? No, there are no public comments. Okay, then we'll move on to the consent items. I believe three through five. Any comments from uh, directors about the consent items? Sure. Oh, yes, Director Valenzuela. I don't have a button that's going to register, Mr. Terry. Um, I just wanted to register on the record for item three on the March 9th minutes that I was absent. I've already registered that with the clerk as well, so that could be reflected in the record. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? We actually got revised once. Oh, you did? Yeah. Any public comment on consent items? No, there are no public comments. Okay, I'll entertain Mr. Them. Chair, I do want to go on record from the clerk's office that we have submitted revised minutes okay. in the record. It reflects every member that was absent from that meeting, including uh, Ms. Valenzuela. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank I'll you. move consent. Second. Okay, we have first from Director Hume, second from Director Singh Allen. Please call the roll. And Directors Frost. Aye. Hume? Aye. Karpinski Costa? Yes. Kennedy? Aye. Maple? Aye. Sandhu? Aye. Cerna? Aye. Singh Allen? Aye. Spees? Aye. Telemontes? Aye. Terry? Aye. Valenzuela? Yes. And Vang? Yes. And the motion carries with those members present. And Desmond's an aye. Thank so, you, <laughs> Supervisor Desmond. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not that it matters. But. Okay. Okay, that will take us to uh, item six. And for item number six, we have um, to introduce the draft staw budget for fiscal year 2023 through 24 and continue to, continue to, June, to the June board meeting. Hello, Dustin. Hello. Let's see if we got to get the presentation going here. Oh. Okay, good afternoon, board, board chair and vice, well, vice chair is not here today. 
I will be presenting on the fiscal year 2024 budget that is currently in draft form and it will be continued to the June meeting for final <laughs> approval. So just to give you a summary of why do we do a budget, where are we at in the process, the law requires we adopt a budget every year, and the draft budget has been reviewed by the ITOC committee at this point, and that was reviewed during their April meeting. Um, the approval of the budget, again, will happen in the June board meeting, and we have one open item, which is the appropriations limit, which isn't released until after this meeting. To summarize some of the policy changes and the budgetary changes that have happened this year, we have a retirement plan funding policy change. Well, we didn't have a policy before, but now we do. Uh, we will be contributing on a five-year amortization for the CalPERS unfunded accrued liability. Basically, that's you've probably heard the term unfunded liability during budget meetings. It's the classic members unfunded liability. Um, they traditionally allocated over a longer period of time, and we've chose to, to pay it over a shorter period of time, which will result in approximately 210,000 in savings over this new payment term. Uh, we have also added a table for the Smart Growth Improvement Program in the budget, so it breaks out the program completely from the CIP budget. Um, and we have a couple of budget resolution items that we're looking to add to the budget this year that are unique this year and we have not asked previously. Uh, we're asking for the executive director to have an amendment limit of 50,000 per fund. This will give us some administrative flexibility on uh, spending in the budget and being able to modify that. Uh, and we'd like to have the executive director have the authority to change sales tax revenues in the related ongoing allocation um, appropriations. Uh, these amendments will be reported to you on the quarterly budget to actuals, so we will be reporting out any changes that do happen. All right, so this slide represents the, con the revenue comparison between 2023's budget and 2024's budget. To explain this chart, uh, there's a lot going on. We have a bar chart that has the changes in dollar value, and that's represented on the left-hand side. And then the right-hand side, we have a line graph that shows you the percentage of the change. Just to highlight some of the bigger items here, we're projecting that sales tax, with the help of Avenue Insights, our um, consultant financial advisor, we're, they're projecting a slight decline in our sales tax revenue going into the 2024 year. And one of the bigger items on here, interest and other, that decrease is because of our proposed refinancing of the bond um, debt and the interest revenue that's represented here is because of our swap partnerships. The swap partners pay us a significant amount of money and we pay them a significant amount of money. You'll see the flip side on the next slide where the, the interest expense is also going down uniformly. Um, FSP and SAVSA and SCT MFP will cover in later slides. All right, so this is the the same chart, but with the appropriations changes for the year. Uh, to cover the, some of the higher points here, you'll see that the ongoing allocations have decreased a little bit, and that's in direct proportion with the sales tax revenues. The capital improvement program has increased significantly. That's really based on our, our agency's input. Um, so it's driven off of other public works departments in the cities and the county, um, and that's how we developed that number. The interest and in other charges have gone down significantly, and that's in direct correlation with the, the refinancing of the debt. So to cover the SCT MFP impact fee program, um, just to talk a little bit about the flow of this money, it is in our CIP program. That's where the, the revenue comes in as it is spent in the CIP program. The revenues and appropriations aren't expected to change very much, and we're currently going through uh, Nexus study that we'll be reporting on later this year. This slide covers the freeway service patrol. One of the only significant changes here is the state allocation revenue is a little bit lower this year, and that's because of the change in the way that we're budgeting. We're budgeting based on how much we believe we can reasonably be reimbursed, um, as opposed to how much money is there. Um, 
and the appropriations are consistent from year to year. The administration budget, uh, the revenues are expected to be consistent. The appropriations have changed pretty significantly this year. A portion of that is because of anticipated outreach services and planning studies that, that staff is planning this next year. And then the larger portion of that, 515,000, is because of our election printing costs, because of the citizens initiative, and based on the election code, SCA is, is liable to pay those um, charges, and we're gonna pay that in the 2024 year. Salaries and benefits are projected to increase um, 55,000 due to the unfunded liability change that I talked about a little bit earlier. Again, that's gonna save us 210,000 over the course of five years. This slide covers the Sacramento Abandoned Vehicle Service Authority. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. The revenues are anticipated to increase. We're ex expecting the program to come back into place in the fourth quarter of this next fiscal year. Um, and Kevin mentioned the, with either the passage of AB 333 or additional um, legal opinions. And the appropriations are expected to increase in proportion because as funds come in, we pass them to the participating agencies. Transit services, um, most of this fund balance is the CTSA, Consolidated Transportation Service Agency funding. And historically, the way that the ordinance was written, we collected 1% of that allocation, of the sales tax allocation, and held it for the third decennial payout. In December of 2020, the board con contracted out these funds for eligible services, and we're currently spending those down. We currently have contracts with SACRT and Paratransit for the expenditure of those funds. And this slide covers our capital improvement program kind of holistically. It's reported on a pro program, let me say that again, a project level and a agency level. So each agency is, is nested with their projects. One of the larger items this year was the Capital Southeast Connector Grant Line Road improvement. Um, otherwise, every agency is fairly consistent with spending year to year. And that concludes my presentation, and this will be continued for approval in the June board meeting. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Dustin. Uh, any questions from directors? I don't see any. Um, do we have any public comment? No, there are no public comments. Okay, so um, do you have a question? Move to continue the item to the June okay, meeting. That was my no, no. <laughs> The chair will second, so we do need to take action on this to uh, continue it, correct? The 16th. Okay. We have a, a motion by uh, Director Hume, second by uh, Director Desmond. Please call the roll. Okay. Um, and Director Frost. Aye. Karpinski Costa. Yes. Hume. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Maple. Aye. Uh, Sandhu. Aye. Cerna. Aye. Sing Allen. Aye. Spees. Aye. Telemontes. Aye. Um, Terry. Aye. Valenzuela. Yes. And Vang. Yes. And last but not least, obviously, Chair Desmond. Aye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and unanimous vote by those members present. Okay. Thank you very much. That'll take us to item seven. And for item number seven, we have the Freeway Service Patrol Zone 2 Request for Bids Determination and Contract Extension Amendment. Good afternoon, board chair and members. Last March, staff released the request for qualifications to area tow providers and providers from outside the area that had previously requested to be included on SDA's FSP procurement mailing list. Three companies, All American, Myers and Sierra Heart Auto Service were deemed pre-qualified to provide cost proposals to any request for bids for FSP services issued through March of this year. On March 15th, staff issued request for bids 23 FSP-02 for Zone 2, which is Business 80 and Interstate 80 from Exposition Boulevard to Placer County Line, to the three qualified uh, firms. STA received responses from All American Towing and Sierra Heart by the deadline. No other responses were received. Both responses were over the estimated budgeted hourly rate. 
STA, our staff respectively recommends the board take the following two separate actions. One, reject all bids received from the RFB 23 FSOP2. Authorize the executive director to extend the current zone two contract for one year. After the contract is extended, um, staff will work to refine the scope of services to stay within the projected budget for the upcoming request for bids. And that concludes my verbal presentation. If you have any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions or comments from directors? I don't see any. Any public comment on this item? And there are no public comments. Okay, so we have to, can we roll that all into one motion or we have to do separate motions? Two separate motions. Okay, so the first, uh, I, I look for a motion to reject all the bids received. I'll make that motion. Maple. Second, Terry. Okay, we have a first and a second on the first motion. Please and call the roll. Members Desmond. Aye. Frost. Aye. Hume. Aye. Karpinski Costa. Yes. Kennedy. Aye. Maple. Aye. Sent you. Aye. Serna? Aye. Singh Allen? Aye. Spees? Aye. Telemontes? Aye. Terry? Aye. Valenzuela? Yes. And Vang? Yes. And um, we do have a, a, a unanimous vote with those members present. Okay, thank you. So uh, we need a second motion to extend the contract. So moved. Second. Oh. Okay, so we have first from uh, Director Singh Allen, second from Director Spees, correct? Yes. All right, please call the roll. Okay, uh, members, uh, Desmond. Aye. Frost. Aye. Hume. Aye. Karpinski Costa. Yes. Kennedy. Aye. Maple. Aye. Sent you. Aye. Serna. Aye. Sing Allen. Aye. Spees. Aye. Talon Montes. Aye. Terry. Aye. Valenzuela. Yes. And Vang. Yes. And unanimous vote with those members present. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item eight. And for item number eight, it's a presentation of the traffic control and safety five-year programs and authorizing the executive director to sign measure A, ongoing annual programs memorandum of understanding with the county of Sacramento and each incorporated city within. Wonderful. Uh, could we please bring up presentation for item eight? Oh, wonderful. Okay, so good afternoon, Chair and board members. Uh, I'm here to present on the Measure A ongoing MOUs and the Traffic Control and Safety Five-Year Programs. Uh, with me here today, we have representation from the counties, the county and the cities uh, behind us if there's any detailed questions on the Traffic Control and Safety Five-Year Programs. So let's talk first about Measure A uh, the funding that goes to this, the, the county and the cities. There's three main sources. There's traffic control and safety program. There's the safety streetscape, pedestrian and bicycle facilities. And then the final amount is for the city street and county road maintenance program. This is the total amount of funding that will be available to the county and the cities over the next five years. That's what we anticipate. Um, for the cities of Isleton and Galt, they get a, a, um, they get a direct allocation as opposed to being part of these programs to give them a little more flexibility. So that's the amount that they get. Um, the way we do these is we have these MOUs, they operate for five years, um, and we, we, it kind of sets the, how, these fund, how these funds are distributed. And so um, those MOUs will expire in June, so we're going through this process of updating these five-year plans as well as getting approval for these MOUs. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the taxpayer safeguards and reporting that are associated with Measure A, um, and these are for the funds we just talked about. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about traffic control and safety program. So the traffic control and safety program um, requires a five-year plan that, be, that is filed with STA. There's a biennial reporting requirement, so they have to update that plan every two years. And then there's also a quarterly reporting. So they have to report quarterly on how those funds are used, and that applies to all of these funds. Um, those quarterly reports are then reviewed by the ITOC, or Independent Tax Budget Oversight Committee. And then as part of the annual audit, there are, there are also some additional checks that are in place. Uh, so specific to the track control and safety program, which I'm gonna present here, are how the, how the funds are gonna be, we anticipate the funds are, are coming uh, over the next five years for the, for the cities uh, and the county of Sacramento. Just a quick breakdown. And so the way the way the expenditure plan is written is uh, those funds can only be used for what's written in the uh, ex expenditure plan. They have this description here. Um, it covers essentially traffic control systems, high priority pedestrian and vehicle safety projects, emergency vehicle preemption, 
Um, and then we have a second document that the board adopts to further, further define that, which is called the definition of eligible expenditures. And you can see that this definition uh, provides a little bit more um, to what, what is eligible. So it's really about um, traffic control and safety on the roads that affects uh, motor vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, um, even people with disabilities. So I'm gonna present at a high level kind of each city and the county. But before I do that, I wanna provide everyone with kind of generally how these funds are being used by the city and county. So first use is planning. A lot of agencies will use these funds for uh, create a Vision Zero plan, uh, what's called a local road safety plan, an ITS plan, which would be an intelligent transportation system plan. They use that for planning. Second thing they use, that, they use these funds for is traffic control and safety operations maintenance and maintenance. So it could be operating a traffic, uh, uh, traffic management center um, that a lot of agencies have. It could be for traffic management and speed control. There's some good examples of what agencies are using, how agencies are using those funds, uh, including maintenance of signals, maintenance of intelligent transportation, maintenance of guardrails. And then the, the last one is the safety and traffic control projects. So these agencies, agencies will either locally fund projects or they'll use these local funds as the match for these grants I've listed here to try to leverage Measure A funds to try to build a lot of these projects we're gonna talk about. So the first high level plan overview I'm doing is for City of Citrus Heights. Uh, keep in mind the, uh, there's an attachment, there's about a three page attachment, sorry, there's a, each city has, or county has provided a plan that's three or four pages long on how they use these funds, and which much more detail than I'm providing, I'm just providing a high level overview. So um, for City of Citrus Heights, I just wanna point out a few things. So um, the old Auburn Complete Streets project is a kind of a good traffic and safety project that is, they use the, um, these funds as the match for active transportation program funds to build this project. And another good project they have is the San Juan Complete Streets Phase 1A project. Uh, they're, they're, they're leveraging SACOG funds. Uh, City of Elk Grove, um, they have several projects here. Um, I'm gonna, they have a good annual speed control program they use to um, address citizens' complaints regarding um, speeding through residential neighborhoods, put in some traffic control measures. Um, on the right, you'll see this Bruceville Road and Poppy Ridge Road intersection signalization project. That was a project where uh, it was existing stop control intersections, but it needed to be signalized for safety, so they, they signalized that intersection. Um, another good one I'd point out would be the Power Inn Road and Congestion Relief Project. This was actually awarded funds by SACOG uh, this month, which is great. Congratulations, City of Elk Grove. And they're using our Measure A funds as the match to move this forward. Okay, City of Folsom. So the city, city of Folsom, they have the traffic maintenance and operations, uh, they, and they also use it for traffic, traffic uh, capital improvement programs. So uh, the maintenance and operations inside, they use it to replace damaged traffic signals, retrofit existing traffic signals. They've got a nice picture of a, a signal cabinet. Um, there's so much equipment in that signal cabinet, it's, it's amazing, but um, uh, they have to continually get that, make sure that um, equipment is in a state of good repair, and they use that, these funds for that. Uh, and then they use it to implement their ITS master plan, their local road safety plan, and some of the other planning documents. Uh, so this is City of Ranch Cordova. They do all, they have a similar operational program called the Traffic Control and Safety Program. And they're also using it for the Sunrise Elementary Circulation Improvements, mm -hmm. um, which is improvements, uh, improvements to essentially improve safety around Sunrise Elementary. And they make a really good statement here. I wanna point this out. So uh, these projects and pro programs are vital to improve the traffic and safety of Ranch, Ranch Cordova, but I think this money is essential to all the communities, right? This is a dedicated source of funding specifically for traffic control and safety to address citizens' complaints regarding safety, to look at issues that they report on. It's used a lot for, for uh, even minor improvements in residential neighborhoods, whether that's speed humps or radar feedback signs. So it's a great source of funding for that. Uh, City of Sacramento, they have a lot of plans. Um, they have a Vision Zero Safety Program. Uh, they, they operate a traffic operations center. They have, um, they actually, they periodically uh, replace damaged guardrail. Uh, and they have a, kind of a unique program, which is a railroad quiet zone program. So they've actually, there's accurate railroad crossings that they've made more safe um, with these funds. And last is the County of Sacramento. So they have kind of a, a nicer way of calling speed, a speed control program called the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program. 
and they use these funds for speed tables, speed feedback signs, traffic calming. Um, they use them for capital projects for safety improvements and then also install and upgrade and coordinate traffic signals. Uh, they provided a really good before and after. Um, so this is the power and road sidewalk improvements. You can see the kind of before and how that could be a safety issue for bikes and peds and how they've kind of after the after the project's completed, they've really improved the, the walkability of this area. So these funds are really used to close a lot of the bike and ped gaps we have, especially when there's an existing safety concern. And I'm sure this one has SACOG funding or some other ATP funding on it as well, but. Okay, so with that, uh, the recommended action is receive and file these uh, five-year programs and then authorize the executive director to sign these MOUs and open any questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Kevin. Appreciate you highlighting these projects from each of the jurisdictions up here. Um, any uh, comments or questions from directors? Yes, Director Karpinski Costa. I just have, if you want traffic management, you could come to Citrus Heights and grab some of those turkeys that are walking across the road. They stop everybody. <laughs> that slows I, people I, down. I have a question. It's cheaper than a speed bump. It's it is, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Take it home, it's, it tastes better too. <laughs> It is. Kennedy's and we put line. a turkey crossing <laughs> sign right where they cross. And do you know they read the sign and cross right at the sign? Anyhow, my question is, on the balance that's, that's on everybody's column, some are high, some are zero, some is negative yeah. balance, what happens to the balance money? Do all the excesses go over to the guy who wants to spend more? Or do you get a chance to use them up? Yeah, I, I think, no, we basically, it's your funding. It goes to your agency. You keep the balance. I, I think what happens a lot in the capital programming world is, you know, you are actively trying to work to leverage those funds. And so you're waiting on these grant cycles, right? So you're like, I've got this great project. I want to fund it through SACOG or active transportation program. And I'm taking this fund balance. I'm going to use it as the match to build a much bigger project. And so typically that, that's how those balances are used. And if they're not used, you may say, oh, okay, we're not going to get the grant. Let's do a small phase of that project with these local funds. So you get an accumulation of funding that occurs just, just to try to make sure that you're leveraging those dollars. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Uh, Director Hume. Yeah, I'd just like to point out I'm not going to be disrespectful and call my constituents turkeys, but that's okay. <laughs> um, even though some of them are. Wait. No. Uh, I, I just wanted to check, since you uh, mentioned that Mr. Bergson's request was going to be discussed under this item, is there anything that he did not uh, do uh, with a timing uh, perspective or anything that we should do to take his uh, request into consideration? The, the way that Measure A is set up, it's very formulaic, and it would, it would, be, uh, it would take the full board action to change how how much funding they get, and then if we take money and give that to them, we have to take money away from somebody else, and that's not what we've been asking as far as any of this, what we've been taking to the board. And that's not what I'm proposing to do. He, yeah. He seemed to mention like he had missed some notification or something that he should have filed for a request about something. Yeah, I, I, I basically I sent out an email requesting information, basically requesting these five-year plans and also requesting some presentation material for them. Um, and... I did not need it from, from City of Isleton because they don't they have their own they have set a aside. Top line and allocation. He, he yeah. thought he missed a deadline, he didn't miss a deadline, he was fine okay. in that regard. That's all I wanted yeah. to verify. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hume. Any other comments from directors, comments or questions? Any public comment on this no, item? There are no public comments. Okay. I this is a receive and file item, no action necessary. And uh, thank you, staff, for the report. I think there was an authorization that the executive director needed. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, You're correct. Right. I would move that authorization. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Thank you, uh, Director Hume and Director Singh Allen. Please call the roll. And uh, Directors Desmond. Aye. Frost. Aye. Hume. Aye. Karpinski Costa. Yes. Kennedy. Aye. Maple. Aye. Sandhu. Aye. Serna. Aye. Singh Allen. Aye. Spees. Aye. Talamantes. Aye. Terry. Aye. Valenzuela. Yes. Vang. Yes. And you unanimous vote with those members present. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to item nine. And for item number nine, it's a presentation of the neighborhood shuttle cycle two proposals. Kevin, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the uh, presenters. 
All right, wonderful. Uh, so good afternoon, Chair and Board members. Uh, today I have two presentations by Sacramento Regional Transit and Paratransit for the Neighborhood Shuttle Program Cycle 2 competitive funding. Uh, we're in the middle of that competitive process with award recommendations coming in June. Staff will use these presentations along with any board comments to finalize staff recommendations for the June meeting. Please note that the total amount of funding requested is slightly less than the three million available over the upcoming three years. Uh, it is also important to note that for cycle one of the neighborhood shuttle program, the amount of funding available was 12.4 million over the first three years. This is four times as much as we have today. And this is primarily due to the accumulation of, of funding that we had since 2009. Um, so this first presentation will be by Sacramento Regional Transit and the second will be Paratransit Inc. And I invite Sacramento Regional Transit to come up and begin their presentation. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Laura Hamm with SACRT. Um, good afternoon, Chair Desmond and directors. I believe you have a PowerPoint presentation for us that's coming up. Yeah, okay, perfect. So thank you for the opportunity to share more information about SACRT's Smart Ride Microtransit program in response to the cycle two of the Neighborhood Shuttle program. This is a quick snapshot of SACRT. We operate bus, light rail, paratransit, and microtransit service across a 440-mile service area. Since 2017, the SACRT family has grown through collaboration and partnership, bringing a more cost-effective transit service, economies of scale, and a truly integrated regional system. SACRT was the first transit agency in the nation to implement a system-wide, fare-free transit system for over 265,000 students, leading to a pre-COVID ridership growth of 7% or an annual ridership of 22 million riders in 2019. We are now seeing a positive trend in our ridership recovery and we are at approximately 70% of pre-pandemic levels with our youth ridership supporting much of that growth. Our microtransit program known as Smart Ride was one of the first and largest of its type in the nation. Our ridership on Smart Ride was minimally impacted by the pandemic and it continues to grow. As you may know, it's a shared on-demand curb-to-curb service available through an app or a telephone reservation and it serves over 750,000 people in SACRT's service area. We should be proud of the fact that this partnership between STA and SACRT on the Smart Ride program has brought Sacramento nationwide acclaim and recognition within the transit industry. More importantly, it has brought transit to underserved residents throughout Sacramento, yielding benefits both in terms of personal mobility as well as public support for transit. Our 15,000 monthly riders pay SACRT's regular fare to use the program. That's a base fare of 250, and all passes and discounts are accepted. The fleet of 45 vehicles used for this program includes seven fully electric vehicles, as well as a, a mix of clean natural gas and gasoline vehicles. We are currently applying for a variety of capital grants that will allow us to expand that zero emission fleet. SACRT's partnership with STA on Smart Ride dates back to 2018 when the STA board awarded SACRT 12 million to scale its Smart Ride pilot from a single zone to a system of nine zones. Since 2018, 14 million in neighborhood shuttle funds have covered most of the operational costs of Smart Ride. With these funds now fully expended, the service levels unfortunately can no longer be fully sustained, but through a combination of careful reductions and greater use of matching funds, SACRT proposes to maintain approximately 80% of existing Smart Ride service levels with just 25% of current annual STA neighborhood shuttle funding. Smart Ride is included in SACRT short range transit plan roughly at current levels. Um, at the time of the plan preparation last year, SACRT was hoping for sustained permanent funding for Smart Ride, um, but unfortunately with the failure of the 2022 local transportation funding measure in Sacramento County, we are now attempting to fund as much of the existing Smart Ride system as possible with a variety of smaller and limited time funding sources. So more detail here on the operating cost of the nine zones. Um, our most expensive zone is the Citrus Heights zone at 1.9 million that also includes portions of Antelope, Orangevale, and Fair Oaks. 
Second is the downtown East Sacramento zone at $1.7 million. Both of those zones uh, currently operate from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., while the other zones operate from 7 p.m., 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We are proposing reductions to both of these um, most expensive zones in order to right size the program and match our available resources. So the annual operating cost of the program in FY24 dollars projected for next fiscal year is roughly 8.6 million. If STA should decide to award SACRT its requested allocation of 800,000 per year for the next three years, combined with its existing funding, um, as well as an application for the LC Top program, SACRT will still need to reduce the cost of the program by approximately 1.9 million. The annexation agreements with Citrus Heights and Folsom directed TDA funding used for their prior dial -a ride programs to Smart Ride, and we also receive an allocation from Sacramento County for the vineyard area. Combined with other sources of SACRT operating revenues, this makes close to 6.7 million available for the program next fiscal year. As we began to strategize on potential changes to the program to meet the available revenue, we looked at a number of scenarios and factors. So this allocation of funding in certain geographical areas was taken into consideration. Um, we are applying for LC top funding for the downtown North Sacramento and Rancho Cordova zones, um, partially due to our use of low or zero emission vehicles in those zones. So we initially considered a number of strategies to, to right size the smart raid program. We did explore the possibility of reducing certain zones to midday hours only, for example, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, this was ultimately viewed as too drastic and would limit the availability of the service uh, for, the, for student and work travel. The idea of an increased fare was also explored, but fare increase, increases provide limited revenue for this type of program. Our total fare revenue for Smart Ride is about 200,000 annually currently. That's less than 2% of the operating cost for the program. An increase would have modest impact, and given the many different ways that SACRT customers pay their fare currently, it would bring much more complexity to the system. We are also mindful of the percentage of riders who are low income using our service. In the end, the most pragmatic approach was a combination of modest service hour reductions, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for all zones, and a reduction in the size of our two largest zones. Um, however, as you can see, we did consider a number of other issues as well. One area that we explored closely was to what extent our zones served an area without any other transit options or with limited options. In some zones, Smart Ride partially replaced fixed route services during our 2019 SACRT forward route optimization. And this includes the Gerber zone um, and a portion of Orangevale where Smart Ride provides a connection to Folsom. We did prioritize the preservation of Smart Ride service in those areas. Other zones, such as Arden Carmichael, Franklin, and Elk Grove, we have pockets without any fixed route service within a reasonable walking distance. Um, and Smart Ride significantly increases transit availability to those communities. The downtown zone, which I mentioned is our second most expensive zone at 1.7 million a year currently, has generally a high level of service. It's served by all three light rail lines um, and a number of fixed routes with a couple of exceptions. That includes the Alder Grove Marina Vista neighborhood, which is south of Broadway and west of Riverside Boulevard. That currently generates a significant number of requests for service. The proposed changes would reduce the downtown zone considerably so that it's essentially only serving that Alder Grove Marina Vista neighborhood and the new Marisol Village housing on North 12th Street. Um, and several other hot spots in downtown. So this would be connecting riders to essential services in the downtown area as well as available fixed route services. In the very large Citrus Heights zone, we felt that some reductions were required to improve efficiency and contain cost. This reduction would eliminate the Antelope and Fair Oaks parts of the Citrus Heights zone and parts of the Orangevale area. However, we did our best to maintain connectivity from Citrus Heights to Folsom and maintain connections to other essential services. We also preserve the most well-utilized parts of the zone that generate the highest ridership currently. 
In the Natomas North Sacramento zone, there's both a lack of fixed route services in western portions of the zone and a significant disadvantaged population in the eastern half of that zone. So essentially, we are proposing splitting that zone in two while still allowing major de destinations in the Truxel corridor for both portions of that zone. Um, it will greatly improve the efficiency of this zone and reduce cost, but still fill that gap in east-west travel from the Del Paso Heights area to shopping in the Truxel Road corridor. Preservation of smart ride in disadvantaged communities was also an important goal. And we have high utilization of low income and minority riders in a number of our zones. 26% of smart ride customers have a household income under 25,000. 37% of riders also identify as minority. We are not proposing any service reductions in Elk Grove, Florin Gerber, or Natomas North Sacramento, where we do see that higher utilization by disadvantaged communities. The service proposed for elimination in downtown and the Citrus Heights zones are not predominantly disadvantaged communities. So here's a look at the overall performance of Smart Ride. The average boardings per hour is 3.2, which we consider good performance for this type of service, with Rancho Cordova as our highest performer at 5.3 passengers per hour. The average zone size is 18 square miles. Um, and an average of 87,000 residents. Our average wait time is around 30 minutes from the ride request with an average trip length of about 11 minutes. And also our average ride rating is a 4.9 out of five from customers using the app. So in conclusion, we are proposing a transition from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for all of the zones and a reduction in the size of the Citrus Heights and downtown zones. We took a close look at various options in making this recommendation and proposal for continued funding. We considered current dedicated funding, existing fixed route service, efficiency, and impact on disadvantaged communities. We, of course, welcome your input to fine tune the proposal, and we solidify our, and as we solidify our available funding for the program, we will be seeking additional input from our stakeholders and from our riders and expect that we would implement any changes to the program around September of 2023. We are also greatly appreciative of the opportunity to partner with STA on the Smart Ride program. We thank you for your innovation and your support of all forms of public transportation in the Sacramento region. And thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to present this proposal. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, any questions or comments from directors? Yes, Director Karpinski-Costa. When you say Citrus Heights to Orangevale, so I know that there's like a whole bunch of seniors that go get dialysis together. So that means they would not have access to get to Orangevale. Is that, is, are you familiar with some of the needs I got a couple of questions because I've been getting complaints and, and I'm trying to, I talk to Mary all the time about, you know, how can we, so that's one question. Another okay. question is you take people shopping, but then when they bring their things back, there's no room to put them in the bus and then they can't take the ride home. Have you heard that? So to answer your first question, I, I pulled the map back up. So we are pre preserving um, the vast majority of Orangevale in the Citrus Heights zone. You can see the blue boundary around the Citrus Heights zone. I'm not sure of the specific destination you're talking about. Um, uh, well, di I'll find out because I'll okay. have Mary look at it. Okay, so if, it, if it's a dialysis go from center. Lakeview Village to senior facility, senior mobile home park. And they kind of team up, you know, okay. so that they kind of share it. It's almost like a, their own private bus. <laughs> and so you know, sometimes using Smart there's Ride some funding available their... through the the um, uh, scene, the um, what was that thing I served on? <laughs> the um, this, the American the senior things. I'm not thinking brains right now. So back to the other question: When people go shopping. They, do you have a policy of what they can put 
back on the... We, we don't have a specific policy regarding the size of packages or the number of packages. What we do ask is that individuals can carry their items onto the vehicle in one trip. They're not bringing bags on and then going back to the curb and bringing more bags on um, to help keep our system on time. And then the other considerations are, are safety related, that we're not blocking the aisles or taking up space that but may be But if someone's needed. sitting in one seat with mm -hmm. something on their lap and they want to put something on the seat next to them that's vacant. I, they... That would be reasonable under our proposal. Okay. Because it yeah. happened where a lady was picked up food for her eight children was not allowed back on the... I, I'm familiar with the um, scenario you're describing, okay. and I, there's always exceptions, and we're going so to take a closer look at that driver, one. the driver? The driver has the, discretion the driver based would, on... The driver would typically um, call for assistance from a supervisor if there was a question, but they're going to base it on if, if it's a reasonable amount of items that's not going to block the aisle of the vehicle. And Thank you can you. certainly follow up with... Director Karpinski Costa about Absolutely, Mary. yes. Thank you. Our staff's been in contact with Mary and we're working on this one. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Director Frost. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I just want to say the Smart Ride has been uh, well warmly accepted in the outlying areas of the county and it's, it's really connected a lot of the, um, a lot of people that in, in the past did not have access. And uh, the question I have relates to Citrus Heights also, but, um, but also Fair Oaks and Antelope and Orangevale in regard to when you're shrinking the service, are you just completely cutting out Fair Oaks and Antelope or is there a way that we can um, have a center point where someone could access Smart Ride to another key locations such as Citrus Heights, which would then connect them with Orangevale and Folsom to, you know, do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, so that I they're understand. not completely taken out of the scenario. They still have service. It's just, they have to go a little further to get it maybe. I understand your suggestion that you're, you're looking at maybe like what we call a hot spot where um, mm -hmm. there would be significant trip generation where we might be able to pick people up. Um, and we would welcome feedback on what those key destinations could be, we in fact, I'll go back to this very first map. Um, you'll see that the bigger circles on this map indicate the highest trip generation areas. And so we could take a closer look at those and see what the biggest trip drivers are in the, in the Fair Oaks and, um, and, North and Highlands. Antelope areas. Yeah, North Highlands also. I mean, those people waited a little longer to get it because Citrus Heights got it first and, and Antelope was asking me, when are we going to get it? And now we're talking about shrinking it back down. So I know people will be, could be potentially disappointed. So if there's a way we can, um, I don't know if it's the PBIDs, you know, the, the shopping commercial centers or, or what that is. But if we could look at that, I think it would it would be appreciated by some of those outlying communities. Understood. Because so Fair glad Oaks to take works closely that. with Orangevale. Mm -hmm. They think they're one. They're kind of like Rio Linda Alberta. They're they're very close in in their community work. So, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Maple. Thank you, Chair, and I really appreciate the presentation. You know, as a SAC, uh, proud SAC RT board member, along with many of my colleagues here, um, I know a lot of the work that that's going on there is uh, done in spite of a, a lack of funding a lot of the times. And um, I think this is the Smart Ride program is one that I certainly um, get a lot of constituent comments about. About something that they really enjoy, uh, that they use frequently, and want to see more of. Um, so I think that this is a really prime example. Of, well, one, I just wanted to thank you for. Um, going through a series of um, a thought process on how to how to do this the right way, um, recognizing that we do have funding challenges and continuing it, but but still doing it in a way that I feel like is pretty equitable um, and taking in all those factors. And so um, I think this is just you know I just wanted to point out that this is a really 
good opportunity for all of us to, to make sure that we're talking with our constituents and our communities and ensuring that they know the importance of some kind of transportation funding measure coming forth in the future, perhaps in 2024, wherever that comes from, um, and making sure that they know that this is, this is important because if they want to see the expansion of these programs and they want to see them continue, uh, we need to have that dedicated funding source. So just really wanted to thank you for the work on this. Thank you for that. Thank you, Director Valenzuela. Thank you. Could you go back to the slide that shows the changes in the boundaries? Yes. It's an imperfect method to look at a PowerPoint slide and try to figure out where that line goes and where this line goes. I guess I first want to start by saying that I'm really excited to see West Natoma still in the boundary. That's in Councilmember Talamantes' district now, but I know we pushed for that before she was in office because they have no RT service <laughs> outside of Smart Ride, and so I'm really excited to see that still included. I guess I'm trying to figure out, in the obviously in my district for the Central City East Sacramento, how that line was determined and what sort of options you see for folks that are now not going to have Smart Ride and other ways they could access RT. Yes, yeah, so and now I wish I had a, a more zoomed in map <laughs> for you, but essentially that is um, the neighborhood, specific neighborhood that I mentioned is our boundary. Um, and I don't have a zoom in on the streets, but I can get that for you. I'll, okay, I'll that excellent. Because mm -hmm. obviously I'm excited to see when you looked at the usage map that there's been really high usage in that area, which is great. I know we have a lot of alternatives though, so I would like to just make sure we're connecting all of those dots and making any potential service changes we might need to make to ensure those folks who might not have Smart Ride have a good alternative. East Sacramento is, is an incredibly diverse community and it is obviously a place of a lot of privilege, but there are people there who are renters who don't have access to other modes of transportation. So I just want to make sure we're thinking that through um, and happy to follow up with you on that as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Laura, I had a question about the, um, the Arden Carmichael zone. You know, I think your chart said 39 boardings a day. I mean, that, that's, that's interesting. Is that what it said? Or did I read it wrong? That sounds about right. Gosh, that's, then there's about 170,000 people between Arden Arcade and Carmichael. Any, any thoughts on, on why it's so low in those areas? What's unique about them, would you say? You know, I, I, I'm not positive as far as, we definitely have some key destinations, including um, the Kaiser Morse Hospital, shopping, other opportunities. Um, we do see some school trips occurring in the Arden Carmichael area. Um, it has been, it's one of our more recent zones and more recently combined zones. So perhaps, um, it has just taken a bit longer for it to catch on. We saw that initially in the Elk Grove zone where the ridership was initially low and then it, it built over time um, as word of mouth spread about the availability of the service. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to follow up with you on that. I mean, it's so underutilized for such a large area. And um, and and so, the zone, so that, that zone was combined. So now you could go from the northernmost part of Carmichael all the way down to Fair Oaks and Fulton for instance, with all within mm -hmm. that one zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other directors with any comments or questions, and we'll say I'll public. just make a quick comment oh. that I can speak, you know, at least um, as a former school board member and as mayor, that this definitely has filled a huge need in our community. And if you look at the map, not this, I have it on my phone, for the service areas in Elk Grove, there's a lot of assumptions of the city of Elk Grove that there's no poverty there. Um, and so the east side of our city has, it's a high needs area and, and part of the zone includes our food bank um, as well. So the, these are much needed services for, for everyone's respective communities, but it also shows equity here of where those needs are. So thank you for always keeping that lens forward and not you know, having this as part of the data driven decision making and seeing and going to where those needs are, I think is important. And SACRT does a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. And we'll just take, we'll do public comment at the end of the, the next presentation. Okay. And okay, with, with that, we can ask Paratransit to do their presentation. Thank 
you. Good afternoon. I'm Tiffany Fink. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Paratransit Inc. Um, and you'll see the PI Solutions. This is some new branding we did to distinguish that we are no longer the ADA paratransit service provider. Um, this was to help when we, the bus shows up to better communicate that there is a broader service network. So we're here today to talk about routes to serve farmers markets and access to healthcare, but quickly, Paratransit is a consolidated transportation service agency. We have been for 45 years. And in fact, we were the first CTSA in the state of California and the legislation is based off the services we provide. As such, we provide a whole host of services, including ADA eligibility, travel training services throughout the six county SACOG region, shared vehicles. What that means is we have 75 vehicles we make available to nonprofits from EG Act, Easter Seals, United Cerebral Palsy, um, Sutter Health so they can transport their clients. Pre-COVID, this vehicle share meant that we did 200% of the ADA rides annually off network. So 100,000 rides were on network. We kept 200,000 rides off network onto our partners. We provide contract transportation to regional centers, community-based shuttles such as the one we're discussing today, um, and do driver training. We do vehicle maintenance, um, including maintenance for Sacramento Regional Transit for 14 nonprofits and do all the taxi inspections for the city of Sacramento. Um, we do adaptive vehicle rentals. Many people do not know this, but we have a fleet of accessible vehicles that can be rented by the public that are wheelchair equipped, hand control. So if you have a disability and want to self-drive, we can make that available. And we are in discussions with the airport about how to make those vehicles available at the airport to people coming to visit the region. We do shared bike and scooter instruction and consulting. So just quickly, one of the things that I wanted to point out is we work a lot with individuals who are older or with disabilities, so we've really moved to this icon-based um, marketing and outreach. We realize that for a lot of people who either have limited English proficiency or struggle with disabilities, icons are how they connect. And so each one of these icons represents the programs, whether it's our access for youth or moving youth to job, which was the workforce program that has been previously um, funded through this. And I can say we'll continue on just with a different funding source to our destinations mobility vehicle rentals, our community food program, which came from the pandemic. To date, we have delivered more than 2.5 million meals to um, individuals in need in Sacramento County, um, we have moved to this type of outreach and it's been very successful. So our mission in general is to expand mobility and accessibility by providing innovative programs and services to the community. So we're excited to be here to talk about how we can bring that innovation um, to this program. So in 2022, the White House convened the second ever uh, conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. To put perspective, the last time this conference was held, Richard Nixon was president. And from that came WIC and SNAP. So the idea was to talk about the growing need for food insecurity in America. It's been a big focus here in the region. Um, and prior to that conference, they actually held listening sessions around the country where they talked about innovative programs that were happening. Paratransit was invited to attend and we participated based on all the work we had done with Family Meal and Great Plates Delivered. Um, from that, there was a big di or an increased dialogue about how do we not only increase food access but deal with the gaps that uh, factor on health. Five goals came from that. The first was to improve food access and affordability, to integrate nutrition and health, to empower consumers to make and have access to healthy choice, to support physical activity for all, and to enhance nutrition and food research. So the programs we're going to talk about today are designed to solve the first three, or at least try and provide solutions. And this all fits a growing effort that paratransit has taken on since we've kind of changed our path from providing the ADA network, which is really looking at what I call purposeful transit, which is how can we provide mobility that also serves other needs that we are trying to settle in this county, whether it's food insecurity, homelessness, um, workforce development, and how can we do that in a way that we better multiple initiatives through one investment. So in 2022, we had also teamed with Alchemist and Meals on Wheels um, to try and put together a program to address these findings. Uh, we ended up creating a program called People to Produce. People to Produce is a, was a pilot program. It was funded at $80,000 a year from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which was, um, I believe, the first time the USDA has invested in transportation in Sacramento. So in this, what we did is develop a route that serves the South Sacramento area and connects the Pinnell Center to the Florin Road Farmers Market. These were chosen because of the need and the food desert that is surrounding the Pinnell Center area and the fact that the Florin Road Farmers Market is the only year-round farmers market in the county. 
Last week was the first week, and on that, we were at max capacity. We saw 194 boardings within three hours served by two vehicles, which meant we were at 32 passengers per hour and a cost of a little less than $3 a trip. I can tell you today we actually exceeded that ridership. Um, and unfortunately, I don't see this as an anomaly because we've already heard of them asking, how do we bring more? Will there be capacity for it? I think it's a reflection of just how great this need is in this region. What we're proposing as part of our uh, address today is to expand this pilot prog program and offer four additional routes which would allow us to connect some of the most underserved food communities um, to those existing farmers markets. I will also note that part of the way we selected the routes was we looked at the efficiencies in our schedule and where we had the most what's called slack or time between services. We do a lot of service to regional centers which is peak hour and how we could cost efficiently utilize time to be more productive to result in a lower cost service that moves the most amount of people. So I know this isn't the greatest uh, map at this point, but we've proposed four zones. The first would be the Upper Land Park, Broadway, Midtown, Downtown area. And the second would be the Midtown, Downtown, Rail Yards, Richards Boulevard, South Natomas area. These were developed in partnership with Alchemist, knowing that there is a large food insecurity and there is limited food within this portion of the corridor. And these would connect to the Capitol Mall um, Farmer's Market that runs from about May to the end of September. The other zones would expand out South Sacramento, um, the remainder of South Sacramento, the Gerber Franklin Mac Road area, so slightly south of where we are, and then also reaching over to the Oak Park Colonial Heights Fruit Ridge and Florin area to connect down to the uh, farmer's market at Florin Road. Um, these are mindful of the services such as SACRT, but a lot of the destinations would require multiple zones, and we know that for people making these types of trips, having to transfer becomes a deterrent. We also are hearing a lot of the older adults talking about needing to bring children with them, and so we're trying to know that that one seat stop is very important. It also allows us to be efficient in the looping because many of them are heat sensitive or weather sensitive, and so time of the route is very important. So the idea would be that on Wednesdays, we would serve the Capitol Mall Market, which is the days it operates. Thursdays would be the Florin Road Market. We are already in discussions with the local food banks about how we could repurpose the Capitol Mall routes into routes to serve food distribution sites from the food banks. A lot of people take their car, but not everyone has a car, and depending on where you live, carrying that much food is really hard even to do fixed route transit. So we're looking at ways we would then, in the off-season, develop routes to access food distribution centers in these key corridors. Each route will continue to be operated by two buses on staggered headways, which will increase the coverage and offer riders multiple options on how they need to shop. We've actually upfitted every one of the cutaways from the standard um, ADA size to have 16 seats. They used to be configured for six. Um, and they have seat back handles. We also have added all the safety features to allow up to 10 standees. So we can get up to 25 people per loop, um, which Excuse is really me, max capacity uh, on this. Director Valenzuela, did you want to have a comment now or wait till the end? End of the Okay, thank you. So we're really working on how we can do that. The pictures here are actually the lines waiting from last week. The second um, portion of this is on the health access side. We've been working with several of the healthcare providers, including River City Medical Group, which is the largest Medicaid, Medi-Cal provider in the county, to address the issue about access to healthcare. This isn't only an access issue, but the fact that our driving economy um, and the cost of health care is driven by people using the emergency room for preventative or reactive care instead of preventative care. And if we can get people good food and the idea of uh, food is medicine and get them nutritious medicine and get them preventative care, we can not only provide mobility and increased health factors, but we can also drive down the cost of health care in this country. So the Health and Human Services has identified a national need for expanded access to health care, and they created the Healthy People 2030 initiative. The idea is to increase access to comprehensive, high-quality health care, um, and it's to get people to that preventative-based. So with that in mind and building off the model we developed with food, we have come to create access to health care shuttles. Um, these were designed to look at areas with quick connections to existing hospitals um, and medical centers. We've actually proposed eight routes. Um, they would operate one day a week, some in partnership with a food route, some on the days there's not a food route, there would be additional routes. Every day would have at least two medical routes running in different parts of the county. We were, For Arden Arcade and Carmichael, we'd be making connections to Mercy San Juan and Kaiser Morse. The Midtown, Downtown Broadway area would connect to UC Davis, Mercy, Sutter, and the community clinics. 
Oak Park, Tahoe Park, Colonial Heights, Fruit Ridge, Lemon Hill. We're looking at UC Davis, Mercy, Sutter, and the community clinics. North and Natomas and South and Natomas with the garden land would come in to get connections to downtown, and we want to intentionally connect to the SNAHC to deal with the Native American health, um, and that's a large draw. North Sacramento would connect in as well. Franklin, Gerber, Mac would then connect down to South Sacramento, and so we'd be talking about Kaiser South and Methodist with Greenhaven, Pocket, Florin, and South Land Park making that same. And from Elk Grove, we'd be looking at additional service to Kaiser South and Methodist. Um, this was really done in discussions with the healthcare providers about access to health. Um, as part of this, we plan to convene an access to healthcare summit to bring the healthcare providers together, talk about how we handle mobility in this region. But we worked, as I said, closely with River City Medical Center to talk about um, the issues they have in getting their clients to follow up health. And their biggest issues were access for food insecurity and access for health. So the shuttle details, as I said, each route will operate initially one day a week, um, with each weekday having two different portions of the county served. They'll serve medical centers, but additionally light rail and bus stops in the corridor and community centers. So we want this to be a place where we can work with trusted messengers to get people to know they can get here and that this is a safe, reliable way to get to the um, medical center. It would also tie into those light rail and bus stops to allow someone from outside these areas to get to a corridor to use the system to um, come through. It would be a deviated fixed route, so it would run on a time schedule, but would allow a curb-to-curb -curb service for up to three deviations, so a little bit of an ADA paratransit-style service in this corridor um, for those who could not access it, um, and those deviations would be able to be a week prior. Hope the thought is that this will help also keep service off of the ADA network where it can uh, be travel trained to here. We've also started as part of our discussions with healthcare, um, the idea that the marketing here will be done to the general public, but we're working closely with the healthcare systems themselves to use the physician, social workers, and clinics to refer clients so that if they have follow-up, letting them know about the days the trips are available in their community and saying, if you have a follow-up, and I know there's a route on Tuesday, let's put your follow-up on a Tuesday. Here's the shuttle. Do you need a deviation? We can book the deviations so that we can get the people there. This is important for the access for the rider, but it's also important for the healthcare systems because one of the challenges the clinics face is many of the clinics struggle to stay in business because they are paid per client. And when their clients no show, the doctors do not receive funding, which is a detriment to doctors wanting to run these types of clinics. So the more that we can get the community to the clinic, the better chance the clinic has to stay operationally funded and to attract good physicians into these types of services. So it goes back to this idea that transit connects the community, um, but when we can really connect the community um, to two transit, it's gonna thrive. And in this idea, it's that idea of thriving not only through mobility, but through all modes of how we function as a community. So some quick performance metrics. The farmer's market, we anticipate a Roughly 26,600 boardings, about 1,600 hours, about 25,000 miles, and we expect that we can maintain passengers clear close to 16 passengers per hour because of the targeted nature of the work. For the access to healthcare, we'd be looking at roughly 53,000 boardings, about 6,600 hours, or 100,000 miles, and we're because of the type of nature and the deviations, cl closer to eight passengers per hour. Um, so. Estimate, estimates come in at nearly 80,000 boardings a year with the $185,000. Our hope is to clear less than $2.50 a ride. And that is our presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, several directors in the queue to speak. Uh, Director Valenzuela. Thank you. Um, really exciting model and program, so thank you for coming to present it. I have some specific notes about the food zone in my district because, you know, we well, there's another year-round farmer's market in Sacramento. It used to be under WX, and it's currently out at Iron Mall. It will come back to WX when that construction is done, so I'd like to coordinate on, I think for me, the priority for those residents in Southside Park is getting is helping them support the art and market because I know those vendors have been impacted by the temporary relocation location for the Caltrans project so that they come back better than ever to Southside Park. And then obviously, once you have that year-round market back right in the middle of that zone, I mean, maybe there's an opportunity for us to work with River City Food Bank or some of the other providers to think about 
swapping that around. Um, and I did want to say, because I know my colleagues in the South are aware that Snack is opening their second location very, very soon um, in the South area. So really excited to see you focusing on how do you get folks from other part of the county to there, because it is the only Native American Health Center for now, but very soon. I'm not sure if that had been communicated, but would love to see how we can expand access across all of the zones to ensure any client of Snack can get to those areas wherever they might live. Absolutely. And I will note, for right now, the proposal is for Monday through Friday, which is why that farmer's market's not in there. That is our current operating hours. Okay. We have gone after an areas of persistent poverty program to study how you could blow this up to a region, a larger scale so that we can go more community-wide dedicated um, service. And with that, there will be a second call for federal funds for the areas of persistent poverty that we're going after for operational dollars, which would allow us to handle what would currently be overtime costs to operate on the weekend. But we okay. are securing funding to get past this phase and already thinking about the future. Okay. And I'm happy. I mean, the capital mall market is fantastic. I think um, maybe it's an opportunity then, though, to, like, during the week go to River City Food Bank, um, because I know getting access there, it can be a challenge as well. So I just, maybe it's an opportunity just for us to collaborate after today about how to best optimize your resources for that. And I look forward to that. Uh, River City Food Bank is already a partner in the CTSA program with paratransit. We do all their maintenance and coordination. So any way we can to expand with partners, we look forward to. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Vang. Thank you, Chair Desmond. Uh, first, I just really wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to Tiffany and just your incredible staff at Paratransit doing this hard work um, and really the collaborative efforts with Meals on Wheels and Alchemist um, to shuttle many of our low-income seniors, especially in Meadowview, to the nearest farmer's market. I think many of my colleagues on this diet know that food insecurity in South Sac, but in particular, actually, the Sacramento region, um, our uh, food insecurity rate is actually higher than the U.S. average, um, and so the need is really dire here in the Sacramento region, um, and we know that ex uh, expanding transportation, having uh, different options for our seniors to be connected to food is so, so vital, and so I really just want to take this moment to say thank you. Um, I was actually at the Pinnell Community Center this morning at 9 a.m. because I had a meeting there, um, and I actually spoke to some of the seniors, many who actually uh, didn't speak English, Spanish, and Hmong, um, and they were super excited about the program. I saw them in their bags. They also got the $20 vouchers from Alchemist, and um, I also understand that there's a long, long wait list. And it's incredible when you are pulling up the numbers how each of the rides is only like $2.32. And um, the budget that you're requesting is like decimal points, right? And I'm just thinking about ways that we can leverage even our local jurisdiction resources and figuring out how we can expand this program because it's just so vital. And so uh, I'm really excited that the program is not only starting in Metaview, but the, there's an expansion throughout the city and especially also a shout out to South Natomas because I know that the need is very dire there as well and really happy to see that on um, on the presentation. So just thank you for everything that you're doing. Stay the course. Um, and then us as elected leaders got to find more dollars to help you expand that program because it's so vital for this region. So thank you. Thank you. And we welcome um, anytime you want us to sit at the table and help you figure out how we can rethink the solution. We're here to be partners. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Maple. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I think you might have already answered my question um, that Director Valenzuela brought up, but, which is, so this is just Monday through Friday, that's correct? Um, because I'm not sure if, uh, well, one, Alchemist is an amazing organization. Uh, they do great work in the district and in my neighborhood. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if they, he, Sam has said this yet or not, but we actually are bringing back the Oak Park Farmer's Market. Um, and the goal is to uh, bring it back year round which will be a great benefit to, to the community, but um, we got to find a way to, to hopefully expand it to because it's on it's going to be on Saturday. So Actually, that was one of the first park uh, projects we looked at other than the Florin. It's the weekend, and because it is for us an overtime where we would have to staff specifically for that, we wanted to start with routes that we could do within our existing um, ex capacity, but that is on our planning, and that was part of what was included in the areas of persistent poverty grant is to look at what would it take to sustain that um, for us. We believe we can recruit and hire for it. It's just a question of what kind of revenue stream, because we don't want to start something, have the community uh, the community depend on it and then take it away because we know it can actually have worse outcomes for them, will, their willingness to engage in the future to solutions. Awesome. And yeah, I just wanted to, again, thank you for your work and want to give a shout out to my colleague, Director Bang, as well for her work on the Food Justice Task Force in the city. And maybe there's a way that, you know, we can connect and be at the table uh, for future discussions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Serna. Thank you. Um, so one of the great things about um, 
public service up here is learning about uh, new things when you thought you knew it all, right? <laughs> so I was really pleased to hear that um, of all the different types of services uh, that paratransit offers, the one that you mentioned, Tiffany, about um, uh, individual vehicles for uh, folks that are traveling through SMF that need hand um, operations. How do we get that word out uh, to um, especially like Southern California destinations, either by way of working with uh, those airport systems or even the airlines themselves that, uh, for instance, may have their own uh, monthly or quarterly um, magazines that we all find in the backs of the seats to let people know that this service even exists. So I guess what I'm asking is how do we get the, the word out um, to, to best uh, make use of that, uh, that, that offering? So we are currently working on the marketing. So this is a program we actually kicked off pre-COVID that kind of slid back. So the first thing we wanted to do is see what happened post-COVID. Um, it's come back just as strong. And so what we're doing is we're currently working with Stephen Clark at the county. One of the questions, you can currently rent it at the county, but you have to pay us a fee to bring you the vehicle and back. So it spurred the idea of what if we could just have the vehicles there. Many of the um, vehicle rental agencies do not offer this type of equipment. We have the ability to be able to have you rent it ahead of time and through a key box access it there. And so um, once we figure out the logistics, the hope is that we would like to see this become a way to market individuals to come to the community, whether it's for um, tourism, but a lot of times it's family members who are coming in for weddings, graduations, all the things we want them to do um, to know that you have an opportunity to be able to do this or you can take your family on vacation um, and have that available. So we would that's something where we are hoping to partner with the county to look at how can we message it. Um, we've already started discussions with the board that we know we're going to need to add to the vehicle fleet, we put in a grant to the Federal Transit Administration um, bus and bus facilities to actually ask for additional expansion vehicles out of the LONU um, process um, because we can do these as hybrid vehicles, but we're continuing to look at ways to do it. Um, we've even started preliminary discussions with our bank about the fact that we can cover the cost of the rental, use the rental to cover the cost to acquire the vehicles, and what would that look like if we actually just purchased vehicles to make them available, knowing this is such a gap in the community. But we would welcome continued discussions because I think this is a huge asset that sets Sacramento apart, and we don't really know of any other program where you can get it at the airport and have accessible vehicles available to you. And that's why I brought it up. I thought it was yeah. really innovative. Um, the other thought, too, if, if it's not part of the existing conversation about marketing, is maybe um, include our health systems too, because obviously you're gonna have folks that uh, may be physically challenged that often use the, the health systems, and you know they should understand that you know maybe once they get outside of the space of a hospital or uh, inpatient care that they, they understand that this is a way that they can expand their mobility options. Um, I just think it's a great idea. Um, but uh, it looks like there's a lot of different opportunities to um, have a m much more robust um, you know, public uh, uh, noticing campaign or marketing campaign and uh, would love to be helpful uh, in any way we can. And if there hasn't been a conversation directly with the airport director herself, I think it might be uh, worth having. I'd be happy to um, arrange that meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Talamantes. Tiffany, thank you for understanding that the issues that we face here in Sacramento are so interconnected. You know, transportation, access to healthcare, access to food, access to education, and really getting from point A to point B, it's, it's all interconnected. So just thank you for your understanding of that. And you know, before I was elected, I had an opportunity to serve our community with you at Natomas High School during our COVID-19 vaccination clinic, you know, where we vaccinated over 30,000 people. And your commitment to being innovative, to being creative, to seeing where we're missing gaps and how we can better serve people is just, Amazing, and thank you for all that you're doing. And I had similar questions as uh, Council Member Maple and Valenzuela in terms of weekends um, and how we can serve our community on the weekends. And I'm also impressed with the airport program, like Supervisor Serna said. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Hume. 
Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm going to take things in a slightly different direction here, and I, I just, uh, first of all, I appreciate all the talk about uh, the farmers' markets. I mean, I think paratransit is the first one. We've talked a lot about uh, uh, farm to fork, and, and paratransit is taking the fork to the farmers, and so that's uh, that's a good place to be. But you know, when Tiffany, um, when we looked at our separation uh, from RT, uh, and I don't think she'll mind me telling this story, but I, I told her she was either going to be like that movie where the guy's twirling his cowboy hat as he rides the bomb down, or she she was going to be the greatest comeback in sports history. And uh, I'm happy to report that I think from everything that we've seen, it is uh, squarely in the latter camp. And I appreciate uh, Director Cerna and others commenting on the innovation uh, because we're at the point now where partners are seeking out paratransit on how do we utilize your services and how do we grow our access and, and how do we do some of these things that make those interconnections. And it really, uh, you know, I, I think Tiffany kind of throws it offhand of how easy it is like, oh, we just decided to do icons because they're easier for people to understand if they have disabilities or, or language. But that, that's all, it, it just comes to be and it seems so effortless. And, and I just want to provide kudos um, here while she's standing in front of this board because uh, as the last remaining elected on the on the board of directors over there uh, unfortunately um, many of us don't get to see uh, just the the innovation is that's happening so congratulations thank you stop worrying and love the ball <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you uh, yeah. that's right <laughs> So thank you, Tiffany, for the presentation. And um, I don't think there you were just you got sufficient feedback. I hope here from the directors. Uh, I don't see any other directors with comments. Kevin. Yeah. So we'll take all these comments and we'll try to we'll come back um, next May and June with some actual recommendations. Hopefully, some contracts so you can actually see what it looks like. Um, one suggestion I have based on this conversation would be if there is interest to provide a letter of support for the area of the persistent poverty grant that they're pursuing. We could put that, I could put that in the uh, action item for next uh, next month if, if we move forward with the awards. I'm gonna take that as a, Pat's okay. thumbs up as a yeah, thumbs up, so. Universal support for that, so. Um, okay, no further action on this item, so we will move on to item 10. Okay, and- Oh, well, I'm sorry, was there any public comment? No, sir, there was okay. no Thank public you. comments. Thanks, Lydia. And for item number 10, we have an update on the refunding of the 2009C, 2014A, and 2015A series bonds variable rate to fixed rate. Great afternoon discussion, bond refunding. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin put it last just for you, Rich. You're, you're welcome, Supervisor Kennedy. He, he requested this be later in the afternoon. <laughs> one, one real quick comment. Um, the meeting goes to 3.30, so you've got 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Funny guy. Can, can we can we uh, recess into a performance evaluation for the executive director? That's next month. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon again, board and board chair. And I'm Dustin Purinton, the accounting manager with STA, and I'm presenting with Peter Schellenberger with PFM, and he's a managing director there. We're presenting on the the continuance the continuing saga of the refunding of the variable rate bonds. And just to give you guys a summary of where we are at in the process now, um, the interest rate and market conditions still favor the full refinancing of the bonds if we continue going in that direction. Um, over the course of the last two months, authority staff and PFM financial advisors have distributed an RFP and we have received 10 responses. All the proposals confirm the viability of our proposal that we presented in March. Um, so it gives us a, a good feeling that we can continue going forward with this. Uh, five of the firms were interviewed and three of the firms were selected for the transaction, the potential transaction. The underwriters selected, uh, Bank of America is, was selected as our senior manager, Wells Fargo and Siebert, William and Shank were our co-managers on the potential deal. The next steps in the transaction um, would be board approval of, of the transaction with more finalized numbers in, during the June meeting. And our projected closing date is early July if market conditions remain the same. If things change, um, we want to remain flexible with this. So we're, we're working on uh, resolution wording to keep that flexibility um, to potentially either revise the transaction or delay it until the market comes back into a more reasonable state. 
and Peter's going to give us a presentation on where the market is today and uh, kind of where, where we have our, our numbers. A brief presentation. But good afternoon, uh, members of the board. Good to be back. Uh, if you recall, I was here uh, the March 9th uh, meeting, uh, a decent set of slides to kind of set the background. The purpose of today is to build off of that, give you an update on the market, and tell you uh, what's changed over the last six weeks. So really a, a, a touch base and an update. Um, one slide on the market. Here's the interest, interest rates over the last six years. The yellow line is the U.S. Treasury curve. It's the 10-year rate for the U.S. Treasury curve over the last six years. The blue line is a tax-exempt curve. Uh, again, the 10-year rate for the tax-exempt curve. Tax-exempt, the tax status taxable and tax-exempt simply goes to say that investors that purchase these bonds, they, for taxable bonds, they have to pay interest on that. They have to pay taxes on their interest. For tax-exempt bonds, not the case. So you always expect tax-exempt bonds to be lower than the taxable equivalent. Uh, the current tax 10-year Treasury is 3.39%. Uh, so it started the week at 3.5%. Some fa fairly favorable news on inflation came out the last two days. Uh, and so the market liked that, and rates came down about 10 basis points just since Monday. 3.4% uh, for, the, for the U.S. 10-year Treasury rate. The tax-exempt equivalent is 2.3%. So we like the higher taxable rate because it reduces the cost to terminate the swaps. We'll look at that on the next slide. We like the, rel we like the lower tax-exempt rates because you as a tax-exempt issuer will go out and issue tax-exempt bonds. So the lower, the better there. Uh, here is the mark to market. Currently, the authority has $318.3 million of variable rate bonds. They have the same, the similar number, the same number of interest rate swaps. Those interest rate swaps, the value of interest rate swaps, uh, go up and down, go up and down, and they go down as taxable rates go up. And so you could see as rates were very low during the pandemic, the cost to terminate and exit the swaps reached a peak of $140 million. Now, with rates relatively higher, taxable rates relatively higher, the cost to terminate is $39 million. So it's a fairly favorable point in time from just a, an exit strategy on the, on the interest rate swaps. So the, the, the proposal would be to use fixed rate bonds, go out and issue new bonds uh, in the amount of about $300 million, to take out the variable rate debt, $318 million of variable rate bonds, and fund this, co this termination cost of $39 million. So with the additional cost, it begs the question, well, how can we do that in a cost-effective manner? Shouldn't we just stay where we are? How can we afford the additional cost? And, and therein is the interest rate. Currently, you're paying about 4% on your, your synthetic fixed rate or your interest rate swap portfolio, about 4%. We can go out in today's market and issue at about 2.95%. So therein is the play. If we could hit the point in the market where the termination cost is relatively affordable and then fund the cost on the tax-exempt side at a, at a rate much lower than 4%, we could overcome this, this $39 million. So those are the set of numbers that I will walk you through uh, on this next slide. So here, here is the current market and the results March 9th. The total cost to, to go out and fund that termination cost and issue you know, relatively inexpensive tax-exempt uh, debt compared to where just staying the baseline cost of $454 million of debt service on the $318 million of bonds through 2039, that $454 million, that would go up by about $10.7 million, or in the present value terms, $9.3 million. 9 .3, so about a 2% increase in debt service costs. In March, it was 12.6 million. So the market's improved a little bit. That's one takeaway from today's discussion. The market's hanging in there and slightly improved. And the cost would be 9.3 million uh, additional cost over the long term through 2039 to exit the swaps and fix it out with fixed rate debt. There's a second piece to this sort of equation. That is the cost and, and the ceiling, if you will, to the increased cost. Of, of fixing out the variable rate debts, the increase of 9.3 million. 
we would issue the bonds uh, this year with the ability to refund those in a ten, on a 10-year period. So fast forward 10 years from now, what's the ability to refund again with the new call option in 2033? So I'll get the forward down soon here. Fast forward to 2033, if you recall, we looked at the ability to refund these bonds once again and to claw back that cost of 9.3 million. Have to make a few assumptions. We assume a 20-year average of tax-exempt rates would prevail in 2033, and we would refund whatever is outstanding, namely the maturities from 2034 through 39, or about, a, about, a, about 150 million of outstanding bonds. Assuming 20-year rates prevailed, uh, you can expect to receive about $15 million in present value savings at that point in time. So those are the two pieces of the equation. You would go out, you would uh, fix out the variable rate debts, terminate the swap. Instead of paying 4%, you would pay 2.95%. The net increase is $9.3 million. Can you claw that back in the future? If rates are 20 on their 20-year averages, the answer would be yes in the amount of 15.2 million for the sort of net overall savings of 5.9 million. It would take, it'd be sort of the patient investor's approach. It would take time to realize that. Okay, what if rates aren't prevailing at the 20 year average? Uh, we do have some cushion. Rates, uh, and this is a moving target, it was different in March and today. Rates could be 120 or a full 1.2% higher in the future than the 20 year average. So, and still claw back the 9.3 million. So that's a fairly fast moving, fairly complex set of numbers, um, but the market's holding in there. You can go out and fix out the variable rate portfolio, folio, current cost 9.3 million, and have the expectation of clawing back that, that, that cost through a future refunding of these 2023 bonds 10 years later, and be sort of cost neutral. So. That proposal uh, was presented in March. Here's the update of the numbers that may have resurged new questions. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director Serna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, appreciate the presentation. Um, so you noted early in the presentation uh, some recent indicators that uh, may leave most of us with the impression that perhaps Inflation has kind of topped out and, of course, on the heels of the Fed's 10th uh, interest rate adjustment. Um, I'm an optimist. I like to think that that would be the case. But uh, given those broader uh, economic um, uh, indicators, is it your feeling right now that it's the right time to strike to go from variable to fix based on what we're seeing in the, in the broader economy, which is a really odd one, uh, given uh, the um, unemployment rate as well. But uh, is that what you're um, messaging to us today? It is. It is. I'm going to go back to sort of make a point that um, it is. Yeah, the, uh, the termination cost was prior previously at 140 million. So you may hope that, and, and for most cases, you do hope that rates come back down. And you're right, inflation was at 9%, the peak, and it's, it's as of April, it's at about 5% year over year. The Fed increased our target rate to 5% last week, and that feels like they're gonna take a pause and that we might see rates come down. So as rate, rates come down, we expect that mark to market, the termination value to go back up. And therein, you're going to have to borrow a little bit more, a little bit more to fund that termination cost. So that's one changing dynamic. So in that respect, yeah, it's a pretty good time to go out and, and eliminate the swaps because, because the cost of doing so is historically pretty good. The difference between the yellow and the blue line is really what's driving the economics. Because, you know, the, the cost of terminating is driven by that top yellow line. The higher the taxable rates go, the lower the cost to get out of the swaps. You're going you're gonna to sell bonds based upon the blue line. So you want that difference to be the greatest. And you can see over the last seven years, it's been fairly tight. So there's an odd dynamic driven by so much going on in the market that the difference between taxable and tax exempt rates is really what drives this transaction. And so with respect to that relationship, now is a pretty good time to go. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, please continue. 
And that's, that's, that's all we had to share to give you an update. There's no action uh, requested. I'll, I'll let Dustin sort of march you through the next steps or Kevin, but we didn't want to catch you off guard with what the heck you're talking about coming back in June with a set of documents to contemplate your, uh, and approve. So let me turn it over to Dustin Thank you. and Kevin. Sure. I don't see any other uh, comments or questions from directors. Did you want to? Yeah, I think we're we're good. I think we'll come back in June with probably some more refined parameters and what we're doing. I did want to mention that we do have Holly from B of A. She's here as well, just to kind of listen in and hear the discussion. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Okay. Any public comment? And no public comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we'll move on to item 11, our last item, comments from authority members. I don't see any. I'm just going to make a, a quick comment. You know, we, we've been meeting with this uh, subcommittee um, to talk about a uh, future measure A and, and hear from various stakeholders. Uh, I believe we're going to come back and maybe report back to the board what, within the next month or so. Something that is, has come up is uh, we know, I think we've all been hearing there's, there's a lot of other groups having discussions about what a future measure might look like. Um, so something that, that uh, Director Singh Alan and I, Alan and, I and, and, and Kevin have talked about is maybe should we, should we look to try to consolidate some of these efforts or at least get everybody at the table? Um, so curious you know, if anybody has any feedback or thoughts about that, but we'll certainly be talking about that in the, uh, in the subcommittee. So would welcome any, any, any feedback or ideas anybody has either now or, or offline certainly. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, having a consolidated effort is prudent, and we've discussed that in the subcommittee as to why, uh, for various reasons, um, in order to be successful, we want to be on the same page instead of different pages. Um, that's not going to serve anybody's um, goals, and particularly what we're trying to accomplish here. So the more that we can bring the stakeholders together and have joint conversations, will ultimately um, suit the best needs of uh, a future Measure A and also all of the various uh, stakeholders that are having sidebar meetings, if you will. We, we need to be on the same page. Uh, time is of the essence, of course. And so the sooner we can have those conversations, um, also in the best interest of transparency, I think that that's, it's very important to, to have these conversations um, somewhat together, and it's fine to have, a, you know, subcommittees and groups having respective conversations, but we do need to, again, come back together. Um, we're already in May, and if we're looking at anything in 2024, we need to, ha we're, we're, we might already be behind. Thank you. Thank you, Director C. Allen. Okay, seeing no other comments, I'll adjourn the meeting at uh, 318.